name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are so happy to welcome all of you to the second lecture on the discourses of Philoxenus of Mabuk. We have been listening to the first talk from Dr. Robert Kitchen, and the first talk introduced Philoxenus of Mabuk, the scholarship on Philoxenus of Mabuk, and how the introduction is being done. We have been so excited to learn about the specialities of his writing. He's not into Christological controversies, but he invites us to be Christ-like. In the last talk, Dr. Kitchen uh, had a call for us to read the discourse loud. So I practiced it for two minutes it is something something amazing, a very mystic experience. Thank you, Dr. Kitchen, for recommending that. So I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Uh, Robert Kitchen for the second talk. This talk is on simplicity. Oh, this talk will be very useful for all of our audience. Floor is yours, Dr. Kitchen. Thank you very much. Um, again, uh, Reverend Sam, and we are... Uh, Again, we're going to be looking at simplicity today. Uh, Philoxenus, just as a quick review with his discourses, um, has, uh, he has 13 discourses. Last week, as, as mentioned, I did an introduction um, and to Philoxenus and his works in general, and then also uh, looked at his introductory um, uh, Mimro, which was not as uh, some introductions would do, would be sort of an overture, a, uh, a review of everything he was going to talk about in a brief fashion. But instead, Philoxenus talked about um, the, the discipline and the rigor that one must use to prepare uh, him or herself um, to uh, embark upon this journey. The first two, um, and, and then there, there are six pairs of um, meme ray, both on uh, each, each pair on the same subject. The first two, um, so therefore number two and number three, are on faith, Hymenuto. The second two, numbers five and six, um, or um, four and five, excuse me, four and five, are uh, on simplicity, Peshitutho. And I thought that, again, we don't have that many uh, opportunities to talk about it uh, as, as would be necessary, that I would focus upon this particular um, uh, pair. The title for today, Tis the Gift to be Simple, is from a familiar song in North America, but it's probably not well known in the Malankara church. It is a 19th century song of a communal Christian group called the Shakers. And the Shakers, by the way, voluntarily ceased to continue several decades ago, but that's another, another story. The song is still sung today uh, in many churches, especially Protestant, and it exemplifies um, their way of life. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, we'll be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bed we shan't be ashamed. Turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. Were the Shakers reading Philoxenus of Mabug? Not really, uh, but they were captured by the same spirit for whom simplicity, Peshitutho, is the solid foundation of the Christian way of life for monks living in a monastery, but as I've made mention before, not just for monks alone. Um, Philoxenus is speaking and writing to monks, yes, but the way of life he promotes 
is beneficial to all people, lay and, and monastic. And this may be a reason why of all the voluminous writings of, of the Bishop of Mabu, this was his most copied and popular text. The discourses following the introductory um, Mimro, um, uh, which was a, a short 23 pages, then has, as I said, six pairs on a certain theme for each pair. Um, the first two were on faith. Um, it has been observed that for, uh, for Philoxenus, faith was our sixth sense. It wasn't just merely a pious religious way of thinking. It was something innate to, uh, to our way of being that turned us uh, logically and, and spiritually in certain directions. However, on the spiritual ladder, there is in the order of things. Simplicity um, uh, is, is really the true foundation of the Christian life. Faith is not first. Um, it is not that simplicity is more important, but it is prior to faith. It comes first. Philoxenus's phrase is that faith is the daughter of simplicity. And this is why in a short series, I want to pick out simplicity um, as uh, a critical uh, trait of the spiritual life. Apparently, the use of the word simple, ashito, has the, the same range of meaning for Syriac as it still does for us in English. Uh, Philoxenus begins um, Mimro 4 with a striking definition says, I'm not speaking about the kind of simplicity in the world that is considered to be foolishness, but the singleness of one thought. So being simple is to obey and not judge. The singleness of one thought means not to have one's spirit and mind crowded out by multiple ideas and inclinations. A number of, you might say, what ifs. Philoxenus begins by giving us examples from the biblical canon. And, of course, he begins the traditional journey uh, with Abraham. Abraham heard God's call to get up and to leave behind um, his family and his country. And there's no recording of any hesitation or questions on the part of Abraham. Abraham heard and he went. Philoxena says, lest uh, Abraham uh, thought he had heard a hint of reward and for that reason followed the word of God. God did not inform him from the beginning of the name of the land to which he was leading him. Indeed, it was a long time before Abraham, Abraham knew that he had indeed reached the promised land. The disciples uh, whom Jesus called, uh, likewise imitated Abraham, he points out, in responding immediately to follow Christ, dropping their nets, whatever they were working on, no questions asked. There is a series of these callings in which they simply obeyed. Philoxenus uh, makes the point clear. A lengthy lesson did not make them disciples. Or there was no academic input, but only the hearing of the word of faith. And this is the custom of faith mixed with simplicity. Who is able to bind and inhibit the soul that, that senses God, Philoxenus asks. And of course, he doesn't expect an answer, no one. Two other biblical characters exemplify the same um, same attitude and response. Zacchaeus, the infamous tax collector, had never met or seen Jesus, but he heard about him from others. And that was all his simplicity needed. Whatever cunning had gathered for Zacchaeus, all the money that he uh, received from, uh, that he really had extorted from taxpayers, simplicity was pouring out. Now, there's 
two other characters, uh, Adam and Eve, are noted, but not for the for the last time. The devil came to Adam and finding simplicity in him, uh, that he was not judging anything. The devil then proceeded to teach him about cunning and slyness. We'll talk more about this first pair, Adam and Eve, um, in a few moments. Philoxenus uh, stops for a moment and he declares simplicity to be the opposite of, of cunning. Simplicity is a fitting description for the person heeding the divine call because, as he points out, and this is perhaps more in a philosophical sense, God is simple. That is, God has no parts or sections. God is one whole entity, undivided, uh, not complex. So he, this goes back to the original concept of a simple person who has one single thought of one simple God. Adam and Eve were originally simple. They were being shown everything in detail by God as a, as a human being, um, but they were not inclined to do anything but to listen and obey. They had not yet thought about God in their mind. Instead of, a, uh, they weren't asking all sorts of intrusive questions like where does this one who is showing us everything um, dwell? How long has he lived? If he is the maker, was he made and who made him? Why did he make us? Um, and why, for what purpose? Did he put us here in paradise? These are not Adam and Eve's questions from the Bible, of course, but they're the questions that Philoxenus is fighting at the time he is writing in the controversies regarding Christ, God and Christ in the aftermath of the Council of Chal Chalcedon. Like Ephraim in the previous century, Philoxenus believes many theologians ask improper questions about God. They challenge God's divine simplicity and make the whole matter of Christ too complicated, confusing, and ultimately too human. So Philoxenus slips in these, what he sees as silly questions into the description um, in paradise of Adam and Eve. Um, and yet there are many today who dare to who do dare to ask just as silly questions of God and Christ. Where did God live? Where does, you know, why did God do this? Uh, how is God made? Simplicity, is, I think I said before, simplicity is the opposite of cunning because it is prior to cunning. In the beginning, there is simplicity in Eden. We human beings, you might have might say this, uh, have to invent cunning for it have to have a role in our behavior and way of thinking. If a child were somehow uh, separated from a human, uh, from human beings in his or her first year and grows up in the wilderness, Philoxenus gives this example, she would be naturally simple, just as John the Baptist was, who grew up in the wilderness. And this is also the reason why Israel in its exodus from Egypt was sent uh, by God to spend 40 years in the wilderness wandering in order to regain its simplicity and to root out all those, remember those murmurings against Moses and God, questioning of their motive. Why are we out here dying in the wilderness and not back at home in slavery? Uh, but having enough to eat. Eventually, um, you know, Philoxenus and other uh, early, uh, early Syriac writers point out that all the murmurers died in the wilderness, and it was only those born in the simplicity of the wilderness who reached the promised land. Philoxenus, however, then give, moves on to another uh, Another biblical character, I think he's a little bit, this is a surprising choice, at least to me, about 
um, about Jacob. You know, many biblical interpreters are puzzled regarding what is usually seen, seen uh, as cunning and crafty behavior uh, by Jacob. But Philoxenus notes that uh, one of his virtues, as with several other um, early uh, characters in the Bible, Jacob grew up in a tent. Remember, he was cooking that red stuff for Esau rather than being out in the world like Esau. He points out that uh, he that Jacob obeyed others simply. For instance, he followed his mother's advice in deceiving his nearly blind father regarding uh, the birthright. He accepted without comment uh, the deceit of Laban, and in his purity of mind, he endured. Even at Penuel, his simplicity was was evident. Without any prelude, it simply says he started wrestling with the angel. And then at the end, he declares, truly, the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Joseph, of course, is the final positive example of simplicity in this uh, Nimro. Um, innocent and simple, he followed his father's directions and loving his brothers, uh, he did not recognize their deep jealousy. Uh, he revealed to them his dreams, not out of his own sense of importance or, uh, or, um, or glory, but out of his innocent simplicity, um, which inevitably, um, or uh, eventually, Jacob had to warn him about, you know, don't talk about your dreams too much. But it is surprising to me, again, that, that uh, Philoxenus uh, stops his discussion there. He did not extend his talk about Joseph's simplicity to his dealing with, if you remember in Egypt, his master's wife who, who approached him, his time in jail, and eventually his release by means of those innocent dreams again, and his rise to ultimate power that is marked by Joseph giving no hint of a grasp for power. The first Mimro comes to a, to a complex, uh, climax with uh, Philoxenus' description of Jesus' uh, directives to the disciples to become innocent like doves towards good things, but wily like serpents towards the bad things. Um, the, this seems to be contrary to this whole discussion about being simple, but the bishop is responding to the saying as a perceived exception or challenge to the nature of simplicity. They are innocent, Philoxenus explains, the simple ones, in order to find their life, but crafty in order not to lose their life. Simplicity is useful for us for the acquisition of, of virtues. Um, but uh, for the acquisition of virtues and craftiness is sought by us so that we may not be deprived of them. So craftiness, not deceptive cunning, has its place in the Christian life as a defense mechanism uh, of defending what is good. There's a subtle difference there, but that may better explain Jacob, um, although Philoxenus did not directly uh, apply that trait to him. He does uh, lift up those, uh, those incidents in the, the gospel. Remember, there were several when the disciples wanted to know who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God which sort of revealed their cunning and manipulation towards power, um, not the gospel. Jesus' reply is a foretaste of what he will talk more about in the second meme row on simplicity. You should become like children. So we'll keep that in mind. You should become like children. We should approach uh, God um, in simplicity. He concludes for simplicity is the habitation of God. It's where God lives. God lives 
in simplicity. If you are simple, you are living with God at that very moment. So do not ever be ashamed of your simplicity, he reminds them. Though the world wants to make you feel foolish for doing so. Philoxenus then moves on uh, to the second meme role in simplicity, although we have no idea when and, and how he did that. Um, you see, there are no notes or prefaces at the beginning of these discourses to tell us what happened next. Um, maybe there were, but now we just have the 13 meme rays separated from one another in their text form alone. Perhaps he preached the second of his sermons on simplicity um, the following day or the following week, but that's conjecture that is, uh, we're not going to go anywhere with, the, with that. The two sermons on simplicity are good examples, however, of how he spoke differently on different occasions on the same topic. The first sermon that we've just you know, review quickly, is essentially a biblical and theological description of the nature of simplicity as giving examples of how it was exemplified in biblical personalities. The second shifts its attention to how the monks sitting in front of him or hearing his words in the chapel being read should use their simplicity in uh, the environment the monastery. And again, I want to, uh, would like to emphasize that the monastic life is not really that distinctive or foreign from the life of the lay person in the world. Just that it's, you might say, its edge and its boundaries are, are more intense. Philoxenus appears to be addressing not the experienced monks, but the relatively new arrivals or novices who are still struggling with the decision they have made to enter the monastery. And are their minds listening to Philoxenus in the, in the chapel, or are they daydreaming of what they left behind home in the world? From what we hear from Philoxenus throughout his discourses, um, a little bit of both. Philoxenus begins, nevertheless, with a more positive um, uh, picture of the opportunity of monastic life for spiritual accomplishment. Simplicity, he emphasizes, is one of the spiritual riches that, uh, that you can find more readily at hand here in the monastery, because the life of the monastery is inherently uh, simple, pashito. No one competes here against one another, he says, or desires better clothes since they all wear the same, uh, the same garments, or no one wants to be greater than his brothers or have more authority. We are all equal, and simplicity is the expression of that way of life, he says. Monks are then depicted um, with, a, uh, uh, I think, a, a memorable image, Monks are physical angels and spiritual beings clothed in flesh. That is the official and ideal description of the monastic life. But Philoxenus knows that they are still very human. He switches um, without pointing fingers at anyone uh, to the cancer of cunning that is both the mother and companion of falsehood. In the world, a simple person is called a fool, but in the monastery, he says it's actually the reverse. The one who is cunning uh, is so notable in his motives and behavior that he is called the fool. A visceral uh, image is that cunning in one's soul is like a prostitute in the marketplace. Philoxenus is direct. He's probably hearing about rumors, unrest, um, conflicts that uh, he has uh, heard been floating around among the residents of the monasteries. Cunning needs to be called out and named, and he identifies the false speech and acts that undermine and destroy the simplicity of life, which inevitably turn one monk 
against the other, just like in the, the lay or worldly life. He returns to the virtues then of being simple. Tis the gift to be simple. And one should be proud and pleased to be called simple. Because just as he said in his first meme wrote, that is the same name of God. You know, people who do who have certain occupations um, are given are given titles and labels according to their occupation. A farmer, a carpenter, a soldier, a physician, an auto mechanic, at least today. Um, God's occupation is simple. And if we are simple, we are living in God's workshop. Philoxenus employs now the image um, of a fertile field, an open field that is ready to receive seeds. Simplicity is the, uh, is, allows us to receive the seeds, for it to grow, to become full of fruit and produce. Cunning, however, fills that field with thorns and thistles, which choke anything that might try to grow in it. There is a little brief tangent to the conversation now. Uh, Philoxenus reminds them that simplicity does not judge the language of faith, and it does not investigate why it com God has commanded us to do things in this way. Now, the buzzword, the verb, I guess, is investigate. Uh, Again, this is sort of following on the little uh, aside he made in the first Mimro. Uh, this to investigate is the expression that Ephraim used to use to describe this uh, over discussion of the nature of God by the Greeks and others who want to divide God into his constituent parts. Somebody in the monastery uh, was probably mumbling about the Council of Chalcedon. And again, Philoxenus points that out. Now he moves back to that title of the simple ones, the simple ones as children, or as Jesus did several, uh, called them several times, he called them the little ones. Sheep and lambs are also employed as fitting examples of simplicity. But there's, there is one thing attractive about a monastery. Philoxenus points out, no one in the world goes hunting for, for uh, cunning people. They're all around you anyway in, in the world. What worldly folk hasten to see, what they run to see, are the simple ones. So they go willingly to the spiritual enclaves outside of the world in order to glimpse the youths, the simple ones, and the infants of Christ. That's why people come to the monastery to visit, to see people living in this simple and godly way. So he's rebuilding this positive uh, environment for simplicity in the monastery. There is joy in simplicity, and it is a source of confidence that one will not encounter and be victimized by falsehood and deception, deception, and simplicity is a memorable, uh, to me, memorable uh, concept. Simplicity, ironically, is not useful for anything. It is. It has its only and greatest value in the life one leads in. It goes on and talks uh, again, going back to these. Uh, to these common crafts and occupations. A king does not know how to perform uh, the common crafts of the world, and that is not a disgrace for him. It may even be an honor for him in not knowing these things, and yet he is maintaining and governing the entire kingdom. Ignorance of the world, therefore, is no disgrace for anyone who lives in the royalty of simplicity here in the monastery. Simplicity has another another virtue, uh, which is seldom paid attention to. It expects evil of no one. Just like Joseph and his brothers, he expected no evil of them. Simplicity believes that everyone is like him. Cunning, on the other hand, also believes that everyone 
is like him, full of dishonesty and deceit. There is no monastery. Philoxenus then makes the, the implication. When cunning, there is no monastery when cunning runs rampant and no one trusts one another and believes they have goodwill. At the end of the Mimro, Philoxenus suggests that there are two phases of spiritual development. The first is what he's been talking about, natural simplicity, which is necessary at the beginning of the, uh, the road of the teaching of Christ. But there's another kind of simplicity, a superior kind to which will, people will develop that he calls spiritual clarity. Clarity uh, is the, the Syriac word, Shaputo. It's uh, translated other places as luminosity, lucidity. Uh, if any of you are familiar with Sebastian Brock's famous book about Ephraim, in, uh, which is called the luminous eye, that's the um, shofio um, I know. It is as if one is looking uh, into a deep pool of water in which there are no ripples or stirring of the wind or contamination of materials in the pool. And one is able to see resting at the bottom, of whatever is there clearly and distinctly. Once again, Philoxenus returns to the image of the uh, field of good soil, no thorns, full of seeds, plants, and yielding mature and ripe fruit. I'm going to close with uh, talking about somebody in the in the Western world. Thomas Merton was the Cistercian, uh, Cistercian or Trappist monk. He wrote a tremendous amount about the monastic and spiritual life. And for his last years, um, he was the novice master at the Monastery of Gethsemane in Kentucky in the United States. One of the books he read and absorbed in the 1950s, and then wrote a considerable amount about, uh, was the French translation of Philoxenus's Discourses by Eugène Lemoyne. He talked about them uh, at length in a section of his teaching these new monks, um, and he was teaching them just like Philoxenus about the spiritual life. So here is his uh, description um, to his monks about what acquiring simplicity is really like. So the first thing Adam and Eve never did was that they never tried to be simple. They never made the slightest effort to be simple because as soon as you try to be simple, you're through, you've had it, you're already complicated. And this is a most important point. The thing to do is to absorb this and immediately forget it. When you walk out of this room, don't give simplicity another thought for the rest of your life. Have nothing more to do with simplicity. Simply walk with God in the reality that he has given us in which we're not thinking about him. We are me immediately united with him and we simply walk with God. We are not aware we are walking with God because nine-tenths of the trouble comes from wanting to see that we are walking with God and not with somebody else. How do I know it's you? That's not the question one asks. Adam and Eve didn't think about him. They didn't say, where did you come from? Where were you at 9 a.m. this morning? You weren't here then. You're coming only in the afternoon. And who made you? Well, mind your own business. I think this is a very excellent expression of what this whole idea of simplicity is and where Philoxenus really gets it across is where he speaks about the child being completely mingled with the word of him who speaks. You cannot attempt to be simple. You can't imitate it. You can't fake it. You are simply simple in God's world. 
thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kitchen, for this uh, beautiful, simple and profound talk on simplicity. Uh, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, it is a starting from understanding about God and moving from there. So, and moving further on to the biblical understanding of simplicity. It's very surprising to hear that he interprets Jacob. Yep. And Jacob is normally interpreted in the biblical traditions and normal scholars find Jacob diplomatic. And the way he takes in is very important in biblical hermeneutics also, I think. Yes, it's quite... Um, would you like to share something more on Yeah, that? I mean, I, I don't have too much more to say other than yeah. what uh, Philoxena is trying to say. He's, he's pinpointing the fact at, at critical junctures in his story, he simply followed advice being given to him. Um, and uh, so that, you know, when his mother says, I mean, he's not thinking of, of uh, stealing the birthright uh, from his brother Esau, but his mother sees an opportunity and she, uh, you know, she, tells him, you know, put on the, the, the sheep's um, uh, sheep wool and uh, fool your father who is virtually blind by that point. Um, and there are a couple of other junctures like with Laban. He never responds um, in, a, in a negative way to Laban. Um, but eventually, yes, he does use cunning uh, to sort of get away uh, or craftiness. There's, there's a distinction between cunning and crafty. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's very subtle. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it, is, it is a striking um, thing that sort of makes his uh, biblical interpretation a little bit distinct from, from other, uh, other interpreters, especially in, the, uh, uh, in older times. But, Someone just asked a question uh, regarding um, yeah. the um, uh, about material simplicity and whether yeah, uh, I'm getting the idea about uh, rich and yeah. somebody rich. So whether a luxurious like, person can can be simple or whether the simplicity it. means to the not, material. Kind not, of. Yeah, it's. Um, I think here's again where when we read an author like this um we uh, and philoxenus gives us 600 pages of his of his thinking um you know we we have to sort of uh, if he doesn't talk about it explicitly and i don't think he does certainly in this in this memo we have to um i think we just have to uh um you know sort of draw our own conclusion and I think basically, yeah, it would be very difficult for someone uh, to uh, to be rich and wealthy and have lots of possessions and be, be simple. They're partly because their mind, and we know this with um, with plenty of uh, uh, people that we may are aware of have have a lot of uh, wealth. Uh, their mind is always being uh, separated towards how do I keep that wealth? How do I get more? How do I prevent losing uh, that wealth? Um, of course, the, the monk, again, we're thinking here about the um, that he is speaking to people in the monastery. They have had to give up their, their possessions. One place where he does talk about the possessions of the, of the monk um, is occasionally it pops up with just a little comment here and there. Uh, where the monk, he, he describes that the monk is sitting in the pew and he's wondering uh, to himself, gee, this life here is pretty hard. I'm separated from my family. It would be nice, uh, you know, if I were to go back into the world and have my job and some of my money, boy, I would, I would 
give them, you know, so much money to and food to the poor, and I would help people out a lot. And Philoxenus says, uh, that is a nice idea. It's more difficult to put into practice than you imagine. Uh, so I think the idea of renunciation, and that will be of course, the uh, the ninth and the tenth um, uh, Mimre uh, are um, are on, uh, or it's the eighth and the ninth. Yeah, the eighth and the ninth are on are on uh, renunciation. Uh, so it is. It we, is have, we have another question: How a frame and fitness is connected? Or uh, this question was posed in the last talk also. This today for yeah. the Severio's class, Father Dale also asked this question: How the phylloxenos and a frame are connected, and what are the yeah reception? Yes, yeah, uh, and it's hard. You know, there have been several um, articles um, uh, written about the connection between uh, phylloxenos and Ephraim. Uh, probably the best one, um, most recent, is by. Um, uh, Lucas von Rampai in uh, the uh, Hugoye Journal of, of uh, Syriac Studies, which of course is online, and you can uh, anyone can can find it. You just search for Lucas von Rampai, and you'll see the article. Um, there is a lot of connection. He's obviously aware of uh, of Philoxenus and his ideas. Um, he does not. Um, cite Philoxenus or does not cite Ephraim in a direct way um, very often. But this particular, uh, as I drew attention, this particular uh, Nimro where he is talking about not uh, asking all these questions about God, uh, in which he's attacking uh, the Greek ideas that drew, uh, that that helped to create the Council of Chalcedon and the Chalcedonian definition, against which his Miaphysite union of Christ natures um, is is uh, is opposing. So he he's picked up this idea that uh, we can maybe it's a I don't know if this is this is probably a simple way of saying it. Um, we can very easily fall into the trap. Of thinking too much about God. We simply listen and follow where God uh, leads us and, and directs our lives. Uh, but we don't ask questions about you know, what is God made of? How is he put together? Um, all the issues about um, the nature of, of Christ in one nature, two natures, human and divine, you know, all of that is... Uh, uh, that leads us astray from this uh, way of simplicity. Yeah, we have, um, thank you. We have another question which says, how do you connect simplicity and honesty together? Or how do you explain these two categories? How yeah. these are connected, honesty in life and simplicity, whether can it be connected yeah. or not? Obviously, simplicity is a very, in, in this sense, is a very broad uh, very broad concept. Uh, so, yes, it is. It is. That's another way of describing it. it's the honesty of, of thinking. Um, and indeed, he points out and he has in this this uh, these two meme right. He has uh, pointed out that uh, that simplicity has no deceit, has no falsehood. So it is. Essentially and basically, um, you know, the, the the place where truth um, and honesty reside, um, and uh, you're not trying to uh, to make someone think uh, differently about you, uh, or or you know, force them uh, or persuade them to go in a different direction. It is simply um, uh, an honest way of speaking about the way things really are. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, here comes a question. You said that this cunningness is opposite to simplicity. 
but coming to the image of dao and serpent craftiness is needed so cunningness craftiness and simplicity are in a very thin membrane so yeah i'm just wondering yeah. how how do we really yeah. make, it, make it that is that is um, i think what has again this we see this throughout the discord uh, or at least we can imagine and maybe it's that i have imagined um we see that uh philoxenus is responding at various times to um questions and challenges that probably the monks uh, themselves have raised mm-hmm. um and um uh, uh so it's it uh, yeah uh, and so that's what he is is uh you know trying to uh um you know to respond to um and so the the difference between these two um is uh yeah is is a very thin one and it's easy to fall uh into the others again he tries to define he tries to create a little bit of a of a definition that is a, a fence or a boundary that um simplicity is trying to uh maintain and save your life mm-hmm. craftiness um we'll use that term here is being used to keep yourself from losing your life from the attacks of others mm-hmm. i i just know that that uh, question um by stephen ray i think we will take um, yeah. I think the question of uh, one second. Yeah. We will get um, Philoxenos of, uh, Philoxenos of, we hear from his memory that like simplicity and criticizes the investigation of God seems different to the Philoxenos who was fully engaged in anti-Nestorian polemics and subtle arguments about the nature of God. So this is a uh, Philoxenos versus Philoxenos yeah. question on the one hand. Yeah. yeah. Can you please... Well, I think in the in the first in the first place, um, Philoxenus is a human being, <laughs> and he is, uh, uh, and our kind of rigorous, uh, you know, uh, examination of, of everything he said and did um, is not what was going on. I think we would find, as, as we often know. um nobody is able to uh to really talk about anything with what we call a tabula rasa of, you know a blank blank slate we have ideas that come to us um you know from uh from our experience from our background and uh philoxena is obvious uh, apparently because uh calcedon happened maybe when he was 5 or 6 years old um and we never hear any reference to his uh, uh supporting calcine mm-hmm. um and so he evidently grew up in the environment where philoxena uh, where uh, the uh what we eventually call the miaphysite theology uh, mm-hmm. is uh was primary um and and as he makes the point uh he's uh he's really attacking what he considers to be nestorianism and um and again nestorianism is is sort of a construct that doesn't always uh isn't always lived out uh, by uh, many many authors so he sees calcedon as being sort of uh nestor nestorian in disguise even though the they rejected the story as at the council of calcy yeah sure he is um he is examining um you know the christological issues with which with as much detail um uh, as others um but again he is talking with the idea of unity and um uh, the unity of the natures of, of christ whereas everyone else is talking about these subtle distinctions between human and divine um and 
Uh, yeah, can we, I think that, that's what we're looking Can we say that? Can we say that this this investigative, exploratory kind of concerns and apophatic concerns go hand in hand in him or go together because they are not opposite? They are they are connected. This apophatic, on the one hand, there's a strong apophatic kind of a nature in his writing, yep. and on the other hand, there is a pedagogical, investigative, and they are they are not opposite. They are connected. How do you think on this question? This concept? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's extending, yeah, extending yes. what Stephen Ring has already mentioned. Yes, that's right. I mean, they're they're all they're all uh, you know. Again, it's the thin boundary line between the uh, between the the doves and the serpents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, being a dove, being a serpent, uh, and. Uh, so that you know, one the language that we use to talk about these uh, these things are simply they're almost the same terms, and so you're you're it's a matter of emphasis, and for Philoxenus and, and the people that uh, you know go along with him, it is the idea of uh, the miaphysite, not monophysite, not one nature, but a united nature of human and uh, divine, that we are not able uh, to, um, we're not able to distinguish, we're not able to describe that that unity. Um, and so, again, he's, that's his emphasis, whereas the emphasis in, um, and I, I'm sure I can be taken into account for this, but the emphasis in the uh, both Nestorian and the Chalcedonian is upon uh, protecting on one hand the divinity of Christ, but also at the same time protecting uh, the humanity. And the two of them end up, um, you know, the, the two ideas, which one you're emphasizing at what point in the discussion, uh, discussion vary. Yeah, I mean, Philoxenus, wants to get away from that investigation mm. um, and yet he's guilty of it in the same way mm. um, yeah. but but it is sort of a principle uh, that uh, that we again just like Thomas Merton is saying you know uh, you got to walk out you got to be simple and walk out of the room and never think about simplicity again in your whole life well being human beings we're going to yeah. And we're going to yeah. think about ourselves. That's part of the mm. the, uh, uh, the nature of being human. Um, mm. And it's our weakness and our strength at the same time. Right. So, yeah. yeah, I think that is a beautiful uh, conclusion to our talk that we have the simplicity as a way of life, as a view of God. And as as we move on in life, we will be always moving to cunningness and coming back to simplicity, but being careful and crafty. So this is a journey that uh, Professor Kitchen has really invited us to continue. As far as we are human being, as Professor Kitchen told, we have to struggle with it and we will move on uh, on this coin. I think from simplicity, the best point to meditate upon is gluttony. I think uh, so. I think the third talk will be a very befitting connection to this second talk. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Kitchen, for your beautiful uh, presentation today. And thanks for the audience you know, for your time and for being with us. And next Saturday, at the same time, we will have the third talk uh, by Professor Dr. Kitchen. Thank you very much. And uh, may the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be glorified now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thanks.